So we have a situation where people are rebellious, they're wanting to do things their own way, they're sinful, and then all of a sudden a priest intervenes for them and goes before God and he asks for mercy. Sounds awfully familiar. Let's talk about that at Sunday School. Hello, I'm Father Timothy Matkin, your instructor for Sunday School, and I'm glad you've joined us here for this study on the Bible and the pandemic. Before we begin, if you would do us a favor and bless that like button down below, that would help us out greatly. Subscribe to the channel, share this on Facebook or Twitter with your friends, comment down below as well. We may be able to address questions and issues that come up along the way. And I'm asking you to be in regular prayer, especially during this time of plague and pandemic. Fast once a week, do penance, examine your conscience and look for things that you need to repent of. And memento mori, be mindful of your own mortality. Always be ready to meet your maker. Before we begin as well, we want to have some opening prayer, and I invite you to pray with me, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be, and we'll have several collects from different prayer books about healing and time of sickness. Let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The first collect is from the 1662 prayer book, the prayer for the time of any common plague or sickness. Let us pray. Almighty God, who in thy wrath did send a plague upon thine own people in the wilderness for their obstinate rebellion against Moses and Aaron, and also in the time of King David, did slay with the plague of pestilence threescore and ten thousand, and yet remembering thy mercy, did save the rest. Have pity upon us miserable sinners, who are now visited with great sickness and mortality, that like as thou didst then accept of an atonement, and didst command the destroying angel to cease from punishing, so it may now please thee to withdraw from us this plague and grievous sickness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The next prayer is from the 1928 Book of Common Prayer, in time of great sickness and mortality. Let us pray. O most mighty and merciful God, in this time of grievous sickness, we flee unto thee for succor. Deliver us, we beseech thee, from our peril. Give strength and skill to all those who minister to the sick. Prosper the means made use of for their cure, and grant that perceiving how frail and uncertain our life is, we may apply our hearts unto that heavenly wisdom which leadeth to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now we have a prayer for those in the medical professions from the 2019 Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, went about doing good and healing all manner of sickness and disease among the people, continue we beseech thee this, his gracious work among us, especially in the healing of Mike in the hospital. Cheer, heal, and sanctify the sick. Grant to the physicians, surgeons, and nurses wisdom and skill, sympathy and patience, and send down thy blessing upon all who labor to prevent suffering and to forward thy purposes of love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And finally, a prayer in recognition of our own mortality from the burial office in the 1979 Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray. O God, whose days are without end and whose mercies cannot be numbered, Make us, we beseech thee, deeply sensible of the shortness and uncertainty of life, and let thy Holy Spirit lead us in holiness and righteousness all our days, that when we shall have served thee in our generation, we may be gathered unto our fathers, having the testimony of a good conscience in the communion of the Catholic Church, 
in the confidence of a certain faith, in the comfort of a reasonable religious and holy hope, in favor with thee, our God, and in perfect charity with the world, all which we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, the first thing we want to do is summarize a little bit what we learned last time. First, we learned that not every destruction of a city is an indication of divine punishment. This was the case, for example, in the fall of Jericho. It was not the result of God's judgment upon Jericho, so much as the fulfillment of God's covenant promise to the Hebrews that they would possess the land given to Abraham's descendants. And so God fought for them in the conquest of Canaan. And then we talked about how there are four sins about which a particular metaphor is used, uh, that of crying out to God in heaven. Uh, the first is willful, willful murder, uh, the story of Cain and Abel in Genesis 4.10. The second is the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 18. The next is the oppression of the poor, which we find with the Hebrews crying out in their bondage in Egypt, uh, Exodus 2.23. And the last is defrauding laborers of their wages, in James 5, 4, where the workers are oppressed. In the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, we learned how God does not, how God does hear the cry out against wickedness, that he takes offense, and that he is willing to get involved in righting wrongs in human affairs. And the fall of cities serve as an example, as a warning and deterrent to all those who come after. With the fall of Jerusalem, we talked about how the Holy Land and the Holy City were God's gift to his people. But when you turn away from God, you turn away from his sheltering presence. And without God's protection, we are helpless and defenseless against our enemies. And also we talked about the plague hitting the city of Rome in the 500s, Pope Gregory the Great's processions imploring God's mercy and his vision of an angel sheathing his sword during the plague at Rome, remind us that the destruction and calamity around us should put us in mind of God and of seeking his favor. We might be given mercy, but even if not, it is a time to examine our lives and confess our sins, to do penance, to prepare our hearts for Judgment Day, and to resolve to live lives that honor the Lord. And we believe in a God who intervenes in history a God who loves us so much that he wants us to repent and turn to him. And sometimes he will use hardships as a tool to get our attention and to beckon us to return to him. Well, here at St. Francis Anglican Church in Dallas, we've been using the prayer from the 1662 Book of Common Prayer, uh, for time of plague or sickness, and uh, I was struck by the biblical references that come into it. So we will talk about the first allusion from that prayer this study, and then on the next session we'll talk about the other allusion to the uh, plague in the time of King David. Today we're looking at the one that talks about um, the rebellion in the wilderness against Moses and Aaron. And let's look carefully at what it says there. It begins, Almighty God, who in thy wrath... So the first thing we acknowledge is that God does have wrath, that he does get upset and angry about human sin. And so he says, O God, who in thy wrath did send a plague upon thine own people. And so that's the second thing that we note, is that God is judging not only the foreign nations, but God uh, perhaps more intensely uh, judges his own people. He watches them, discerns, and guides them, and sometimes corrects them through chastisements. So, O God, who in thy wrath did send a plague upon thine own people in the wilderness for their obstinate rebellion against Moses and Aaron. So when the people left Egypt, it was a tough time, and uh, there was a lot of grumbling and complaining along the way. There were even some insurrection along the way. And part of what happened is that there was a... Um, well, some divine punishment that resulted from some of that insurrection. And so that's what we're going to look at today. I think the best way to introduce this is to look at Psalm 106, which is a long litany of the confession of Israel's sins. It's a recognition, Lord, we have messed up. We have a whole history 
of messing up, but we also have a whole history of discerning how you are gracious and how you put up with us and how uh, you call us back home and we mend our ways and you're good to us again and that's what we want in the future. So it's a, li it's a bit long, but if you bear with me, I think it's important to look at this entire psalm to kind of get the, the context, the lay of the land in terms of this long history of Israel and its kind of tug of war back and forth with God with his favor and with his chastisements. Psalm 106 goes like this. Praise the Lord. I'll give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty doings of the Lord or show forth all his praise? Blessed are those who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, when thou showest favor to thy people. Help me when thou deliverest them, that I may see the prosperity of thy chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of thy nation, that I may glory with thy heritage. Both we and our fathers have sinned. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider thy wonderful works. They did not remember the abundance of thy steadfast love but rebelled against the Most High at the Red Sea. Yet he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make known his mighty power. He rebuked the Red Sea, and it became dry, and he led them through the deep as through a desert. And so he saved them from the hand of the foe, and delivered them from the power of the enemy. And the waters covered their adversaries, and not one of them was left. Then they believed his words, and they sang his praise. But soon they forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel. But they had a wanton craving in the wilderness, and God put them to the test in the desert. He gave them what they asked, but sent a wasting disease among them. When men in the camp were jealous of Moses and Aaron, the Holy One of the Lord, the earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of Abiram. Fire also broke out in their company. The flame burned up the wicked. They made a calf in Horeb and worshipped a molten image. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that feeds grass, that eats grass. They forgot God their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and terrible things by the Red Sea. Therefore he said he would destroy them, had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them? Then they despised the pleasant land, having no faith in his promise. They murmured in their tents and did not obey the voice of the Lord. Therefore he raised his hand and swore to them that he would make them fall in the wilderness and would disperse their descendants among the nations, scattering them over the lands. They attached themselves to the Baal of Peor, and ate sacrifices offered to the dead. They provoked the Lord to anger with their doings, and a plague broke out among them. Then Phinehas stood up and interposed, and the plague was stayed. And that had been reckoned to him as righteousness, from generation to generation forever. They angered him at the waters of Meribah, and it went ill with Moses on their account. For they made his spirit bitter, and he spoke words that were rash. They did not destroy the peoples, as the Lord commanded them. But they mingled with the nations, and learned to do as they did. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. They poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. They became unclean by their acts and played the harlot in their doings. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people, and he abhorred his heritage. He gave them into the hand of the nations, so that those who hated them ruled over them. Their enemies oppressed them, and they were brought under subjugation under their power. Many times he delivered them, but they were rebellious in their purposes and they were brought low in their iniquity. Nevertheless, he regarded their distress, 
when he heard their cry. He remembered for their sake his covenant, and relented according to the abundance of his steadfast love. He caused them to be pitied by all those who held them captive. Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the nations, that we may give thanks to thy holy name and glory in thy praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, I've often been struck by how the Bible is remarkably able to tell it like it is, how it is not shy in being honest about the, own, the, the faults of God's own people, um, being willing to confront our own sins and shortcomings and ask for forgiveness. It's a model for us to follow in our own personal lives. Now, before we get into this rebellion in the wilderness, let's also keep in mind the bigger context of them leaving Egypt um, because that involved a series of plagues. And it's all the more astonishing that this rebellion occurs in the wilderness given the fact that these are all people who lived through those moments and saw those mighty works of God. So let's refresh our memory about the Exodus. What happened back then? Well, God heard their cries of oppression and slavery under this new Pharaoh that came in and did not treat them well or reasonably as the previous Pharaoh had. They had hard bondage, and so they complained and cried out to God in heaven. He heard. And the worst of these uh, series of oppressions was limits on their freedom of worship. It's almost like they could put up with anything as long as they were free to worship God. Now, the initial plan, a lot of people, if, you, if your knowledge of the Exodus just comes from seeing movies and TV, this is never covered. But the initial plan was to ask Pharaoh for permission to go out to Mount Sinai, where God was, to offer sacrifices, and to come back and go to work again on Monday morning as slaves. But God had something more grand in mind for them. And so he hardened Pharaoh's heart in order to force the issue. When things don't go our way, we're tempted to become despondent. But it just may be that God has a plan in place that includes blessings that we cannot foresee or understand from our own perspective. And so we should trust in the role of providence, remain faithful, and surrender to his will. Of course, as you recall in the story, there are a series of plagues that come. We find in Exodus 7, verse 2, God said to Moses, You shall speak all that I command you, and Aaron, your brother, shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then... I will lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth my hosts, my people, the sons of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. Now, each of these plagues that came upon Egypt, except for the last one, were were versions of normal calamities which might befall the area during a season. And they come in natural progression, each one leading to another. But in this case, all of these coming so rapidly, so closely, and so intensely reveal their divine origin. The word plague, interestingly, is from the word for blow or strike. And the effect of a plague was to demonstrate that you you just cannot win a battle with God, and that the God of the Hebrews is the only one with any power, the only real God. And so God is inflicting these death blows upon those who are holding his people hostage. The first plague was the turning of the water of the Nile to blood. Now, on rare occasions, overflowing waters would carry this red decaying algae, or sometimes volcanic ash, into the stream of the river polluting it for a time, turning it red, making the water undrinkable. But this time, this time, turning to blood, their own history of violence came back upon them that was their judgment, cutting off the water of life 
from the oppressors of God's chosen people. It's interesting that an ancient Egyptian text, the admonitions of Ipur, if I'm saying that right, describes it this way, quote, Indeed, the river is blood, yet one drinks from it. One turns away from people, yet one thirsts for water. And the text mentions the river turning to blood in conjunction with the description of foreign tribes who have entered into Egypt. Then the second plague is this plague of frogs. So the subsided floodwaters left all these dead frogs all over the place on the land. Heget, the goddess of life and fertility, is represented by a frog in Egyptian art and iconography. The importance of this point is realized in the following interplay between Pharaoh and Moses and Aaron. The former requests that the two brothers play, pray to the Lord simply to remove the frogs, with the, the implication that they would return to the Nile. But the end result is not only the death of the frogs, but the piles of rotting frog corpses, so that the land stank. So once symbols of the goddess of life, the frogs now embody the stench of death. Plague number three is the gnats. So multiple plagues are going to fall like dominoes, each with each strike setting off the other. And these swarms of gnats had, of course, bred and multiplied in the stagnant pools of water. And then plague number four is the insects. This carcasses of dead frogs became breeding grounds for swarms of insects, especially flies, symbols of demonic harassment and harbingers of sickness and death. Beelzebub, the Canaanite deity worshipped by the Philistines, was called the Lord of the Flies. And then we get to plague number five with cattle diseases. The livestock became sick from these plagues. And of course, losing them was losing an important food source. And then plague number six, the boils. The diseases moved on to humans as well. Significantly, the Egyptian religious leaders can no longer appear before Pharaoh for this reason. The significance of this is that the Egyptian priests shave their entire bodies every day to ensure perfect and hence pure skin, or else they would be considered impure and disqualified from temple worship. Priests with boils means no offerings in the temple. No offerings in the temple means distress for the gods, and distress of the gods means chaos and collapse in Egypt, defeated at the striking blows of the God of the Hebrews. And then plague number seven is the hail. The rare thunderstorm with intense hail destroys what is left of the season's crops and livestock, endangering vast numbers of Egyptian lives. And then plague number eight, the locusts, Swarms were driven in by God with an east wind to devour what remained of the crops. Pharaoh, at this point, confesses his sin, and in response, God drove the locusts out toward the Red Sea by a west wind. But then Pharaoh's heart was hardened again. And so we get plague number nine, darkness. What is this all about? Well, we do know from time to time the dust clouds would be carried in from the desert, creating a darkness that could be felt, as it's described. But the intensity and timing of this plague clearly communicated that the god of the Hebrews was dominating the impotent god of the Egyptians, which was Amun-Ra, the sun god whom they worshipped. So the god of Hebrews is able to blot out the god of Egypt. And then finally, plague number 10, the death of the firstborn. This clearly communicated that you had no future as a people without offering worship or sacrifice to the one true God, for only the blood of that sacrificial lamb has the ability to tell that angel of death to sheath his sword and pass over that family marked with the blood of the lamb. And so, finally, Pharaoh let the people go. God chose his people and protected and guided them with his hand but they would not be immune from the scourges of his wrath. In particular, we get reference to rebellions in the wilderness in which God responded with plagues of disease, among other punishments.
Well, let's look at a series of verses that talk about plague in the wilderness and the first episode of plague. In Exodus 32, 35, we read, And the Lord sent a plague upon the people, because they made the calf, which Aaron made. Then in Leviticus 26, 21, If you walk contrary to me, and will not hearken to me, I will bring more plagues upon you, sevenfold as many as your sins. We learn also that imploring God's mercy in worship is the way to respond to his message communicated via plagues and continually implore divine favor. Numbers 8, 19. And I have given the Levites as a gift to Aaron and his sons from among the people of Israel to do the service for the people of Israel at the tent of meeting and to make atonement for the people of Israel, that there may be no plague among the people of Israel in the case the people of Israel should come near to the sanctuary. In their desert sojourn, there was a lot of complaining by the people who were continually given to a rebellious spirit. In response to their hunger in Numbers chapter 11, God made quail to fall out of the sky to feed them meat. Even though they already had manna each day, they, they longed and they wanted for meat, and so God gave it to them. But even this wasn't enough. The complaining went on and continued, even as they ate the quail. Numbers eleven thirty three, While the meat was still between their teeth, before it was consumed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. Now when they approached the promised land, the scouts were sent in to report on the conditions there. Some lied and said the inhabitants were unbeatable and they should just stay away and avoid the land. In response, God made them wander in the wilderness until that generation died off. And we read in Numbers 14, 37, the men who brought up an evil report of the land died by plague before the Lord. And there it seems that that particular sickness only struck those guilty individuals in that case. Well, now we get into the first episode of rebellion and the plague that follows. Numbers 16, uh, chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. Let's read the story um, about this um, question of who can speak and act on behalf of God. Numbers 16. Now Korah, the son of Izar, the son of Kohath, son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with a number of the people of Israel, two hundred and fifty leaders of the congregation, chosen from the assembly, well-known men. And they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and said to them, You have gone too far, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? When Moses heard it, he fell on his face, and he said to Korah and all his company, In the morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near to him. Him whom he will choose he will cause to come near to him. Do this. Take censers. Korah and all his company put fire in them and put incense upon them before the Lord tomorrow. And the man whom the Lord chooses shall be the Holy One. You have gone too far, sons of Levi. And Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi. It is too small a thing for you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do service in the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister to them. And he has brought you near to him, and all your brethren, the sons of Levi, with you. And would you seek the priesthood also? Therefore it is against the Lord that you and all your company have gathered together. What is Aaron that you murmur against him? And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and they said, We will not come up. Is it a small thing that you brought us out of a land flowing with milk and honey, 
to kill us in the wilderness, that you must also make yourself a prince over us. Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor give us an inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. And Moses was very angry and said to the Lord, Do not respect their offering. I have not taken one ass from them, and I have not harmed one of them. And Moses said to Korah, Be present, you and all your company, before the Lord, you and they and Aaron, tomorrow. And let every one of you take a censer and put incense in it. And every one of you bring before the Lord his censer, two hundred and fifty censers, you also and Aaron, each his censer. So every man took his censer, and they put fire in them, and laid incense upon them, and they stood at the entrance of the tent of meeting with Moses and Aaron. Then Korah assembled all the congregation against them at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Separate yourselves from among the congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and thou wilt be angry with all the congregation? And the Lord said to Moses, Say to the congregation, Get away from about the dwelling of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Then Moses rose and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he said to the congregation, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest you be swept away with all their sins. So they got away from about the dwellings of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents, together with their wives, their sons, and their little ones. And Moses said, Hereby you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, and that it has not been of my own accord. If these men die, the common death of all men, or if they are visited by the fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates something new, and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into Sheol, then you shall know that these men have despised the Lord. And as he finished speaking all these words, the ground under them split asunder, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with all their households and all the men who belonged to Korah and all their goods. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive into Sheol, and the earth closed over them, and they perished from the midst of the assembly. And all Israel that were round about them fled at their cry, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up. And fire came forth from the Lord, and consumed the two hundred and fifty men, offering the incense. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, to take up the censers out of the blaze, then scatter the fire far and wide, for they are holy, the censers of these men who have sinned at the cost of their lives. So let them be made into hammered plates as a covering for the altar, for they offered them before the Lord, therefore they are holy. Thus they shall be assigned to the people of Israel. So Eleazar the priest took the bronze censers, which, which those who were burned had offered, and they were hammered out as a covering for the altar, to be a reminder to the people of Israel, so that no one who is not a priest, who is not of the descendants of Aaron, should draw near to burn incense before the Lord, lest he become as Korah and his company, as the Lord said to Eleazar through Moses. But on the morrow all the congregation of the people of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. And when the congregation had assembled against Moses and against Aaron, they turned toward the tent of meeting. And behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And Moses and Aaron came to the front of the tent of meeting. And the Lord said to Moses, Get away from the midst of this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces. And Moses said to Aaron, Take your censer, and put fire therein from off the altar, and lay incense on it, 
and carry it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone forth from the Lord. The plague has begun. So Aaron took as Moses said and ran into the midst of the assembly and behold, the plague had already begun among the people. And he put on the incense and made atonement for the people and he stood between the dead and the living and the plague was stopped. Now those who died by the plague were 14,700 besides those who had died in the affair of Korah. And Aaron returned to Moses at the entrance of the tent of meeting when the plague was stopped. So in this rebellion, they've just tried to reject God's appointed mediator. And now he is standing between the living and the dead. He is the one thing between them and the wrath of God. And it's the picture of Christ standing in between the dead and the living, that the plague might be spared, except he bears the plague. This whole passage is a glorious meditation on Christ's mediation. Now in the next chapter, chapter 17, uh, we have the story of all the heads of the tribes putting their staffs before the Lord. And it's the staff of Aaron that blossoms, demonstrating from then on that his lineage is the one that holds the true priestly authority. So who can speak for God? Let's read some comments from the church fathers related to this. This is uh, Numbers uh, chapter, um, chapter 16. So Ambrose uh, has to say on this passage, Clearly the man, Aaron, who is proposed as a leader to all, is worthy. For when the fateful death crept into the midst of the people because of their insolent, because of the insolent, he threw himself between the living and the dead to restrain death, lest many should perish. Truly the man is priestly in mind and heart who throws himself with pious love before the flock of the Lord like a good shepherd. In this way he broke the sting of death. He held off the attack. He put an end to the dying. Piety assisted merit, since he offered himself for those who resisted. And then another comment from Caesarius of Arles. If you know the course of history and have been able to perceive with your eyes, so to speak, the priest standing in the middle between the living and the dead, rise now to the loftier height of these words. See how the true priest, Jesus Christ, took the censer of human flesh, put fire on the altar, which doubtless is that splendid soul with which he was born in the flesh, further added incense, which is his pure spirit, stood between the living and the dead, and did not allow death to proceed any farther. So in this wonderful passage, this frightening passage as well, we have an image and a type and foreshadowing of Christ himself standing between God's wrath and the people, making intercession for the people. This is what Aaron did in the wilderness when there was even a great rebellion, when it's not only Korah and Dathan and Abiram who were rebelling, but 250 of the leaders of the people, people chosen by the multitude. And so even the multitude is uh, not without uh, complicity in this matter. They have seemingly consented, even though it's only 250 uh, leaders or officials that are chosen, they are representing a great multitude. And there's, so there's great discontent in the wilderness. Um, even though they've seen all of those wonders and miracles that brought them out of Egypt, they have not just lost faith in Moses, but they have lost faith in God, in a sense. And they are rebelling against him, uh, wanting to uh, take up their own um, role in the priestly ministry and priestly service. Really, basically, they're craving power, uh, which is what this all comes down to. They want the power that they see that Moses and Aaron have, and so they crave it for themselves. And so they unleash upon themselves this judgment and punishment from God. A plague has come upon them, and so immediately Moses says, Hey, brother Aaron, go grab your censer, throw some coals in it, grab the incense, um, and I want you to walk among these people and pray for them to be spared. And so think of it, these priests who have been 
challenged in their authority. God has backed them up. And yet at the same time, they are throwing themselves into harm's way, interceding for these people who have a rebellious spirit. And that's how it's supposed to work. The priests are supposed to be among the people, interceding for the people, always at the altar or with the sick and the suffering and the dying, praying for God's mercy. And we are so grateful for all of those priests around the world who have put themselves in harm's way at the Lord's service and the service of his people, always maintaining their prayers at the altar, visiting the sick, putting themselves in harm's way, and doing what a priest does, which is throw himself upon God's service, asking and pleading for mercy and grace from above. And for that, we are truly thankful in this time of plague and pandemic. Well, that was the first great rebellion in the wilderness that brought about a plague. Uh, 14,700 people died as a result of that plague. But then there's a second plague that comes about as a result of rebellion in the wilderness, a more serious kind of rebellion. And this we find in Numbers chapter 25. So let's look at this uh, plague story in Numbers 25, beginning in verse 1. While Israel dwelt in Shittim, the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, Take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before the Lord, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, Every one of you slay his men who have yoked themselves to Baal of Peor. And behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel, while they were weeping at the door of the tent of meeting. When Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the inner room and pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman, through her body. Thus the plague was stayed from the people of Israel. Nevertheless, those that died by the plague were twenty-four thousand. And the Lord said to Moses, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel, in that he was jealous with my jealousy among them so that I did consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore, say, Behold, I give to him my covenant of peace, and it shall be to him and, his, and to his descendants after him the covenant of a perpetual priesthood, because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. Now this is a very interesting story, um, and one that is... Uh, uh, inspired uh, works of art, this story of Phineas uh, spearing uh, this man and woman. Um, what's going on here? Well, first of all, we need to keep in mind that God had strictly warned them again and again and again of the dangers of intermingling with the people that they meet along the way to the promised land. And then when they get into the promised land, uh, basically God says, don't don't get too friendly with this people because they are idolaters and you do not want to become an idolater. That's one of the worst sins that you can commit. Um, and here you have um, this worship of um, Baal at Peor and um, Israel is getting a little bit too friendly with the natives and joining in their worship. And we are reading that um, the people were invited to the sacrifices of their gods. Um, we might look at this as kind of like a friendly neighborhood invitation to a barbecue, except in this case, it's a religious occasion where they're going to sacrifice to their gods and they're going to basically eat all the, the remaining meat 
uh, from the sacrifice, and they're going to engage in uh, some probably cult prostitution. And um, they often, um, the pagans, uh, included uh, sexual immorality in their worship as a kind of uh, um, way of uh, beckoning the gods of fertility to bless them, um, just as the gods of the land blessed the land with fertility and so on. And so they are intertwining, they are um, lust, engaging their lust for food and their lust for sex, and they're falling uh, prey to the natives who are worshiping their pagan gods in a way that is uh, not only giving false worship to a false god, but is engaged in, in immorality in the process. And so this outrages God in heaven, and he gets involved, and he says to Moses, uh, this has to stop immediately. This is an extremely serious matter. So take all the people who are in charge in leading, leading this, the people who are responsible, and execute them immediately. And um, this is what you need to do to make uh, atonement for this grievous action. And basically remember the covenant idea, that the covenant is between God and the people, not God and individuals. So those who turn against the covenant, who violate the covenant, um, the only way to handle this, rather than bring everyone down, is to expel them from the community. So they are no longer a part of the covenant because everybody has to keep all of the covenant commandments. And going against the word of the Lord, especially on this matter, is extremely grievous. And so this is the only way that it can be handled. So God says, execute all of the leaders who have led this innovation and given their approval to this and let, them, let that be an example as a deterrent to all of the rest of the people. And so Moses responds and takes charge and, and has it done. And the people are weeping. Now, for some reason, it kind of skips over. But during this intervening time, a plague has broken out. And that's part of perhaps what's awakening uh, the people to the severity of this crisis that... Uh, God has sent a plague upon the people in response to their, um, basically their adultery and idolatry that have mingled themselves together. And so the men have been executed that were responsible for this. But then comes one more in who I guess didn't get the memo, uh, was out of town vacationing, didn't know what was going on, who knows. And uh, he wanders in with this uh, Midianite woman that he uh, perhaps is wanting to marry, bring into his family, or maybe some kind of concubine and entertainment on the side, or some um, affair has been carried on, whatever it is. He's, he's bringing home one of these Midianite women. And uh, Phineas, uh, one of the uh, young priests, um, when he notices it, um, wants to fulfill uh, the command that came from God to execute all of the leaders who are facilitating this um, great idolatry and uh, adultery. And so he jumps up and grabs a spear and runs after them right into their tent and immediately executes them, spears them through. And so then uh, the response of this is that God said uh, he did a right thing. Uh, if he had been acting like this um, on his own, um, he would have been guilty of, uh, of murder. But here he was executing God's judgment. The judgment had already been passed. Uh, the sentence of execution was to be carried out. Uh, Phineas uh, jumped up and fulfilled that, perhaps because maybe the people who were responsible for doing that were not responding or taking any action or didn't know what was going on or what have you. Um, but this man returned right in the midst of, it seems like, some great procession or litany or um, act of atonement that was going on. And so not only was this man deserving of death and under the sentence of execution coming back into the camp, but he seems to have arrived just at the wrong moment when atonement is being made for this sin. And lo and behold, all the sudden we have a new example of this sin taking place. And so Phineas jumps up and goes and takes care of it. And God responds by speaking to Moses, uh, saying that Phineas has done a good thing, that he was jealous uh, for the Lord, 
And we also have to know that the word jealous and zealous uh, are the same Hebrew word. They can be translated either way. And in fact, they both kind of communicate in different um, subtleties uh, the sense of that word, that it's about burning with enthusiasm and, and zeal uh, for God and for his temple and for his worship and his purity and so on. And so Phineas jumps up in great zeal and takes care of business. So God says he is blessed, he has done the right thing, his posterity will be blessed, and he and his descendants will serve me continually as priests. We do find one further mention of this um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 8. Uh, Paul is uh, referring to um, some of the um, faults of their past and the way God has intervened and responded. And he says in ver verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 10, We must not indulge in immorality, sexual immorality, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. And so Paul talks about that great uh, plague of judgment that came about in the day of Phineas. Now let's turn to the church fathers. Oh, by the way, this is a series that uh, I have that's um, a very um, worthwhile investment, although you can now find at, um, I forget what the website's name is, Katina, Katana, something like that. I'll put the link down below in the show notes. Um, you can basically find pretty much all this material online for free now. But this series is basically what it says, uh, ancient Christian commentary from the church fathers on various books of the Bible. And so on this passage we have from Cyril of Jerusalem, he says, if Phineas by his zeal in slaying the evildoer appease the wrath of God, shall not Jesus, who slew no other, but gave himself a ransom for all, take away God's wrath against humanity? So much like we saw last time with Aaron standing in the breach, pleading for mercy for God's people, uh, being a type and a foreshadowing of Jesus, here they see the same thing with Phineas. Only Phineas does not kill someone else, but he allows him, Jesus allows himself to be killed. And then Gregory of Nyssa has this to say, Now we, if we have been conformed to his death, Jesus' death, sin henceforth in us is surely a corpse pierced through by the javelin of baptism, as that fornicator was thrust through by the zealous Phineas. So St. Gregory uh, sees in this uh, a type and a foreshadowing of the way that baptism, like that spear, has pierced us through and killed uh, the fornicating, lustful impulses within us. And in fact, that's what Paul uh, means when he talks about uh, mortification, putting to death those lustly impulses within us, those carnal appetites, starving them out, putting them to death. And uh, Tertullian uh, sees this episode, this episode in uh, Numbers 25 as, as, a, as a passage that talks about God's judgment on fornication and lustfulness. And then Origen has this to say, Lest we appear to you to bring these things forth from our own understanding, rather than from the authority of the divine scriptures, go back to the book of Numbers and recall what Phineas the priest did when he saw the harlot of the Midianite people with an Israelite man clinging in impure embraces in the eyes of all. Filled with the wrath of divine jealousy, he drove a sword which he had seized through the breast of both. This work was imputed to him by God for righteousness. When the Lord says, Phineas appeased my rage, and it, has, and it shall be imputed to him for righteousness. That earthly food of anger, therefore, becomes our food when we use it rationally for righteousness. And so in that last line, what Origen is talking about here is that um, anger can often easily get out of control. But remember, God says in the Bible, be angry and sin not. So that impulse, that emotion, when acted on according to reason, can be put to good use. And so every time we have a response that is a response of, of anger, of being upset, of being outraged at great, um, great sins in the world, great injustices being done, we should use that righteous indignation 
and act according to reason and act rightly in response to it. And so the sinfulness comes in often when we, when we don't act according to reason, when we just go on impulse, when we follow our, our basest impulses and don't act according to reason. But virtue is about acting according to reason. So we harness that energy that comes from the emotion, the appetite of anger, and we use it and direct it toward a rational and righteous end. So what is our takeaway from this? Well, certainly we should recognize that God's people have a rebellious spirit. I mean, the world is in rebellion against God. Pagan people are in rebellion against God, unfaithful, atheist, so on. But even God's people sometimes, oftentimes, have a rebellious spirit. We might say that even within the heart of the individual, there's a dark corner here and there where there rests a rebellious spirit. We have a tendency to want to revolt against divine authority that God has established and assert our own wills instead because we feel we know better. And when this has gone too far, God calls us back to obedience, sometimes through the action of a plague or disease or other misfortune. We should heed those calls and repent and return to the Lord. God will have mercy, accept our sacrifices, and forgive our sins. And God's priests can stand between the people and the divine wrath that they, jo that they so justly deserve. Above all, of course, Jesus, our great high priest, has done this for all time in his atonement at the cross and his resurrection victory over death and the grave. Well, thank you for joining us. Next week, we'll look at the other judgment mentioned in this collect from the prayer book, which is the plague upon Jerusalem in the time of King David. Please join us again for our next study. And if you're in Dallas and you're local, I invite you to come join us for worship in person. You can look us up and learn all about us at stfrancisdallas.org. Please like and share, and we will see you there. God bless. Oh,